What's up, Ninja Nerds? We're gonna do some case study today. So this is case study six. I'm excited to get started on this. So on um, this case, we're gonna be talking about a patient who presented uh, to the emergency department with a headache. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. First things first, important to remember, medical disclaimer, these cases that we're talking about are fictitious, they're not real, um, they're referenced and created by us here at NinjaNerd, and they're meant for educational purposes only, okay? All right, so let's start off with the patient's uh, chief complaint. Their chief complaint was, it was a 48-year-old male who presents with an intense headache. So my question for you guys right off the bat is when someone comes in with a headache or any chief complaint, what is the acronym that we learn in school? What is the mnemonic that we utilize to characterize and kind of uh, go through all the different steps of trying to truly understand the person's headache? We will ask these particular set of questions. There's kind of an acronym for that. Does, do you guys know? So just to give you guys kind of a little bit of a hint, it starts with, there we go. Someone hit it, Jasmine Dwyer. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right, OPQRST. So let's go ahead and OPQRST this bad boy. So when we ask the onset, we ask if there's any palliative or provocative factors. We ask the quality. We ask if there's any radiation of the headache and where is it located and where does it radiate? What's the severity of the headache? And then on top of that, the timing. And there may be other mnemonics out there. I'm seeing old cart and some of these other ones. Yeah, again, this is just the one that um, it's common uh, to usually learn in school is OPQRST, your chief complaints. So when we OPQRST this guy's chief complaint, this is what we come with. So he says it started about an hour ago. Okay, ibuprofen hasn't helped. So there hasn't really been too much, you know, palliative effect. Um, he says the only thing that really kind of helps is when he uh, walks around and paces all over the place. That's the only thing that can kind of make the pain just a teensy bit better. Um, he describes the headache as stabbing, burning, and it's located primarily around his left eye and around like the left forehead but he says he feels like the pain radiates behind his left eye. He grades the pain a 10 out of 10 and says that the pain has been relentless and constant. He states that he's never had a headache like this before. So to kind of summarize the OPQ or ST of that, the onset was an hour ago. Was there any palliative factors? A little bit. He says that whenever he walks around, it helps a teensy bit. Ibuprofen doesn't. Um, nothing really provokes it anymore um, than he already is kind of having this pain in general. He describes it, so then we say the quality of it is stabbing and burning. The location of it is left eye, left forehead. Radiation is behind the left eye. Severity, S, is 10 out of 10. And then the pain has been relentless and constant for the timing, okay? All right, let's move on. I'm not even gonna acknowledge some of you smarty pants out there. All right, so the next aspect of this is his past medical history. So COPD, um, he is a smoker. He smokes about a pack a day. Uh, Panos, no, there was no vomiting. Uh, social history, again, he smokes a pack a day, drinks about one to two alcoholic beverages a week. Uh, no known drug allergies, no known food allergies, medications that he takes is he takes an albuterol inhaler as he needs for the COPD, uh, ipratropium bromide as needed for the COPD, and then he takes a daily inhaled corticosteroid. Okay. All right. So you guys, some of you guys are already quest, quest, throwing some thoughts in there. So I like it so far. I'm not gonna give away the answer yet. <laughs> All right, physical exam, BP 138 over 74. Well, you know, not high. It's technically, it's like, you know, it is technically classified as kind of a hypertension, um, but it's not, uh, you know, like the, the stage two type of hypertension. But again, he's, he's getting up there. Heart rate, 125. Respiratory rate is 18. 
Uh, SpO2 is 90%, 98% on room air. And temperature is, he's 98.6 or 37 degrees Celsius. So when we look at him on his uh, just physical exam, he appears to be in a significant amount of pain. Um, he's got conjunctival like redness. It's really red and even a little bit of uh, redness around the actual uh, aspect of like the other aspects of the conjunctiva. So the, the, the particularly the uh, bulbar conjunctiva is, is nice and red. He's got ptosis of his left upper eyelid. He's got a lot of uh, secretions, like a lot of like tearing from that left eye. He's got a lot of nasal secretions um, and it's pretty much clear. His neuro exam, he's alert, wake oriented times four. So you know, you know, he knows where he is, person, place, time, and why he's there. His right pupil is a little bit bigger than the left pupil. So he has some anisocoria, but both the pupils are reactive to light. His extraocular movements are intact. His visual fields are full on confrontation. His uvula and palate and tongue are midline. Whenever you have, you know, have him say, ah, there is no deviation. And when he sticks his tongue out, it's also midline. When you test his strength, it's five out of five in all four extremities. And he's intact to light touch. Cardiovascular, he is tachycardic when you're listening, um, but it's a regular rhythm. There's no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. He's clear to auscultation, bilaterally, no wheezing rails or wrong guy. His abdomen is soft when you palpate it. Normal active bowel sounds, no tenderness to palpation. And when you check his dorsal pedal pulses, they're, uh, they're nice and plus two, and he has no edema there on his lower extremities. Okay? So that's our physical exam. So this guy's got a headache comes in with vitals that are relatively normal. I mean, the blood pressure is a teensy bit high, but it's not too bad. And then he presents with, he looks like he's in a lot of pain and he's got the conjunctival hyperemia, the ptosis of the left upper eyelid, a lot of lacrimal secretions, a lot of serous rhinorrhea, a left pupil that's a little bit uh, smaller than the right one. He's got, again, um, you know, pretty much that's, that's the big stuff for this guy. And he's got some ptosis of that left upper eyelid. Alrighty. All right, so we should always ask the question whenever we have a person coming in with a headache, um, is there any red flag signs? And so there red flag signs, you guys remember the mnemonic? Snoop. <laughs> so is there any systemic symptoms, right? Does he have any fevers? Does he have any chills? Does he have any myalgia? Any you know weight loss? Does his secondary risk factors suggest potentially um, you know, anything particularly that, that's worrisome, like HIV, malignancy, or immunosuppressive conditions. Um, and then again, is there any um, other aspects of this? Uh, so is he, you know, does he have any neurological deficits? Could we say that the left pupil being, uh, uh, you know, particularly that left pupil being smaller than the right pupil is a neurological deficit? It could be, it could be. Um, they are reactive though, so people can have anisocoria and it be physiological, but when it presents with a headache, you gotta be a little bit concerned there. He doesn't really have any weakness, he doesn't have any sensory changes, but that pupil, it could be a little bit concerning. Um, again, is he old? He's not really old, he's not greater than or equal to 50. Um, his onset was a pretty abrupt and acute and he's never had a headache like this before, okay? And then again, was anything like, was it uh, particularly positional and he didn't notice anything that when it was positional he didn't notice anything about a pattern change because he's never really had a, a, a headache like this as well and when we I didn't list this but when we look at the fundoscopic exam on them there was no papilla edema so is there any kind of like red flag signs oh awesome 66% said yes I would agree I would agree. I would say that this is an, uh, an acute onset. It was an abrupt headache and he's never really had a headache like this before. I'd say if he had a history of these kinds of headaches and it's like, oh, this is my normal. I usually have these kinds of headaches. Then I'd say, okay, maybe there's not. But with the potential pupil, uh, again, the fact that they're reactive, I'm not as like on high alert, but the fact that there is an anisocoria present and this is an acute onset, abrupt headache. And he's never had a headache like this before. I'm going to be careful. So yeah, I would say that there is red flag signs. Okay, great. Now, if there's red flag signs, what are you concerned about then? What do red flag signs tell us? What, what we should be concerned about is something else called secondary headaches, right? So if you guys watched our video, we talked about a bunch of different types of secondary headaches. We're not going to list all of them, 
but these are the ones that are a little bit more ominous, a little bit more life-threatening, a little bit scarier that we want to make sure we don't miss. We don't want to miss a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We don't want to miss a brain mass. We don't want to miss um, some type of hematoma, epidural, subdural hematoma, okay? Um, so those are things that we have to be thinking about. All right, so with that being said, what's your likely diagnosis? Okay, thinking about this, he has red flag signs, so we'll probably get some, maybe, maybe we'll get some imaging, we'll see. But at this point in time, what's your likely diagnosis out of these options here? If I were to say, what's the likely diagnosis? Migraine with aura, cluster headache, migraine without aura, or a tension headache, which one would you guys pick? Okay, now let's, now this is assuming that this is potentially a primary headache, okay? He does have some red flag signs, uh, that acute onset, um, that intense headache that he's never really had before, that's concerning, um, and we will follow up on that, but at this time, I'm still thinking that this could potentially be a primary headache, so out of all the primary headaches, just so I keep a differential running, which one would you guys most likely suspect this to be? So what do we got? Some guys are saying brain cancer, subarachnoid hemorrhage, <laughs> cluster headaches, hematoma. All right. You guys are all thinking pretty darn well. I like you guys' uh, thought process. What was he doing prior to the headache? Ah, uh, he wasn't doing. He was just sitting down at his ha at his house, um, watching some ninja nerd videos. <laughs> All right, so the top one was cluster headache. You guys are correct. Yeah, that's a, that's what I would be thinking about as the likely diagnosis. Again, think about the. This is like literally the the like the perfect case that you would get on, on an exam. Um, if you saw this on an exam, you you got to be thinking cluster headache, and the reason why you want to be thinking about cluster headache is what were some of the objective and subjective info that really would support that diagnosis. Now we're not guaranteed just because we think that it's cluster headache does not mean that it is guaranteed cluster headache. I just have a high suspicion that it's a cluster headache. So here's some of the things that should key you off, especially when you see this on your actual exam. Okay. It's unilateral. It's frontal, orbital, supraorbital, and that big thing is retroorbital kind of like pain. That retroorbital pain, that radiation, that's a big, big telltale sign. Stabbing, burning, that's another telltale sign. They're so restless and they're constantly pacing around because that's the only thing that can help them. And it's constant. Usually the duration, you know, it's you know, it's it, it's cyclical. So another thing that might come up on the exam is, and again, this is the, you know. The, the tough thing to pick out with this person is usually these come around at the same time of the day. And again, they'll happen at multiple times. You can have one to eight episodes a day and they can be, you know, anywhere from 30 minutes up to a couple hours. Um, but usually they occur at the same time in the day and they occur multiple episodes. And then they may have this remission period of about 12 months and then have some more cluster headaches. The other thing is on his physical exam, he had that conjunctival hyperemia, the lacrimation, the rhinorrhea, and the partial horners, right? The meiosis. So the left pupil was smaller than the right pupil, but it was reactive. And then he also had the ptosis of that left upper eyelid. So again, it could be. But again, I, I'm still, I, I really should be careful. Just because you have like this perfect case doesn't mean that there could be something lingering in the background. If this is the person's first cluster headache, boom, an engineer in for the win. But what if it's not and it's something more ominous? He has red flag signs. Should we get any imaging, guys? Would you guys order it? Would you get a, a CT? Would you get an MRI? What do you guys think? Any CT MRI peeps? And again, just think about why would I order a CT or MRI? If I'm trying to order a CT or MRI, it's because I'm looking for something inside, a structural lesion of some kind. 
So thinking about what if by some chance this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage? What if by some chance this is a epidural subdural hematoma? Or what if it's some type of brainstem pathology? Um, what if they have some type of dissection and I'm missing a carotid dissection? Because sometimes a carotid dissection or vertebral dissection can also present uh, with uh, some Horner syndrome as well. So again, thinking about all these things, what if it's something a little bit scarier and I'm missing it? Um, I just don't want to miss that. So everybody said yes, and I think you're all correct. I think we would be uh, justified in saying, I think that this person warrants imaging to make sure um, that they do not have a secondary cause of the headache, especially if, even if, here's the big thing, even if this is the person's first cluster headache, even if this is, the big thing is, if, even if this is their first cluster headache, you should obtain a CT or MRI of the brain, maybe even getting some of the neck vessels as well, like a CTA of the head and the neck, to rule out any secondary headache. You just do not want to miss anything, okay? Even if this is the first cluster headache, you still should go to imaging, okay? All right, good. Thankfully, the imaging was normal. So now that we know that the imaging was normal, there was no structural lesions, there was no uh, dissections, there was no mass effect, there was no cranial pathology of any kind, then what would you think the diagnosis is? It's a cluster headache, right? If it is a cluster headache, which for this point, we've already proven with all the imaging that it is, again, it's nothing else could be, there's no secondary headache here that we're seeing. Uh, what is the first line treatment assuming that this is a cluster headache. Would you give them some ketorolac, which is an NSAID? Would you give them a non-rebreather? Would you do verapamil, like a calcium channel blocker? Or would you give them some fentanyl uh, as an opioid? <laughs> so someone, uh, Belal, Bangash said no CT because papilledema is absent. I would still get a CT um, just because, again, if this is their first onset, if they had a history of having cluster headaches, then I might not do it. But if this is the first headache and they have some of these signs, I'm going to make sure that there isn't any kind of uh, intracranial pathology. I think that uh, you would not be wrong in doing that. Yeah, you, you always should rule out other options. I mean, especially with this patient, it was a pretty, you know, it's a pretty scary thing when someone comes in and they have some type of uh, anisocoria, they have um, this insane headache. This is the worst headache they've ever had. They've never had a headache like this. It came on acutely, abruptly. I think all of those things warrant um, a CT scan just to make sure. All right, so what do you guys think? Some people are saying high flow, high flow, high flow, magic mushrooms, holy crap. <laughs> um, all right, let's see, what do we got? What's our options here? What's our winner? What's the winner, winner chicken dinner? I would ask if he was Washington football team. If so, ask him to try rooting for a different team. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I am a Washington football uh, fan, so whoever said that, you can suck it. <laughs> oh, wow. You guys went straight for the hardcore. You, fentanyl. All right. All right. So generally, um, NSAIDs aren't going to be um, as effective um, in cluster headaches. Um, Verapamil is not as acute on it kind of it doesn't have that rapid acting onset um and fentanyl is a pretty aggressive one to go straight off the bat with it probably would help but um again the thing that's been shown to be very effective right away um, is a uh, high flow oxygen particularly in the non rebreather um, it's been shown to potentially produce a little bit of vasoconstriction um, as well as potentially inhibit the sphenopalatine ganglion so that would be the first thing. So the first option would be a non-rebreather, six to 12 liters per minute. Okay. All right, so you do that. Um, and then while you're doing that, um, giving them the non-rebreather, uh, you should also do something else. I should give them something else as a potential option here 
um, we have here again another couple options to potentially give them on top of that non rib breather so you gave them the non rib breather you started that you got them on the oxygen okay once you have them on the oxygen you should give them this other medication because that is going to also kind of help in a particular way and I want to see what some of you guys are saying ibuprofen wasn't making a dent yeah ibuprofen and those kinds of medications they're, they're not like the, the, the best um, in these kinds of scenarios Yep, yep, high flow is okay with COPD. It's not going to do anything negative to them. It's, it's different, you know, if you're trying to ventilate somebody, ventilating a COPD is something that's a little bit tougher, but no, putting them on a high flow, uh, particularly a non rebreather, um, that's, that's not going to cause any problems. Yeah, I would stay away from fentanyl. All right, so what's our options? Sumatriptan is the number one, with the dihydrogurtamine being the number two. Okay, great. So I would, I'm very happy with that decision. So first line, the technical first line drug, right, is sumatriptan. Um, sumatriptan should be your first one. So if this comes up on a test, the first one that we said before, you give them non-rebreather, six, 12 liters per minute, and then give them a sumatriptan as well. If they, for some reason, you can't give them a sumatriptan or you give them a sumatriptan and it doesn't work, you can give the other option, which is B, dihydroergotamine, okay? So that's kind of an ergot. They have somewhat of a similar mechanism of action. The only thing that's a little bit different is that sumatriptans act particularly on 5-HT receptors like the 1B and 1D, whereas the dihydroergotamine works on various 5-HT receptors. So they may it may induce like some nausea type of effect um so again in these scenarios um sumatriptan should be your first line an alternative um could be something like dihydroergotamine or if that uh, sumatriptan fails you can consider dihydroergotamine okay yep ems jen is right it won't really help you with um Fentanyl is not going to be great in kind of cluster headaches. Okay. All right. So let's go on to the next thing here. All right. So I want you guys to be thinking about this. Like, so when we give a medication, we should always remember if I'm giving this particular medication, what patient population, what things in this person's history should I be looking out for? Because if I give this, them this medication and they develop an adverse drug reaction, I may need to consider doing another option if there's other options that aren't going to cause these problems. So before I give the person a triptan, I need to look through their medical history and make sure that they don't have any contraindications to it. What is a particular contraindication out of these listed here that you would be a little bit concerned about to say, mm, I, I don't really, I don't feel comfortable giving this medication to them. Um, you should be thinking about that. Okay. Any particular uh, contraindication listed here, which one do you guys think would be uh, one that you would not want to give them to? Uh, sumatriptan is for migraine, right? Sumatriptan can also be given for migraines. Yep. Hello, Eric Dog. All right, what's our option? All of the above. All right, you guys are awesome, man. Great. All of the above. And the reason why is um, uh, sumatriptan basically is a vasoconstrictor, right? So it's going to squeeze down and clamp on vessels. So if it clamps down on a peripheral vessel in the leg and you already have a pretty significant peripheral artery disease, so you have some significant plaques or accumulation of plaques within kind of a, a, a femoral vessel or a popliteal vessel, um, and you now clamp down on that and you reduce the blood flow so significantly that you don't get blood flow past that point and you end up with an acute kind of limb ischemic event, um, that's something to think about. If you clamp down on the vessels of the coronary system and you cause an acute MI or you lead to an instemi or some type of unstable angina or Prinz metals uh, vasospasm, and pregnancy, it can also lead to contractions of the uterus. So that's, again, another thing that's contraindicated in. 
all right so thinking about these things now he didn't have any peripheral artery disease he didn't have any coronary artery disease and he was a dude so he's not pregnant so <laughs> he didn't have any contraindications to this so he would have been a good candidate for getting sumatriptan okay all right we aborted the headache now that we've aborted the headache with the non rebreather we gave the sumatriptan as an alternative or if it doesn't work you can give dihydroergotamine okay now that we've aborted the headache, which one of these options is kind of like the best option for prevention of the headache? Okay, so which one of these options is the best option for the prevention of the headache going forward? All right, so basically verapamil is acting as a calcium channel blocker, right? And so the way that that one works is not completely figured out, but it may inhibit the release of CGRP, um, particular neurons that it can induce cluster headaches. Um, ibuprofen, again, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so it's gonna reduce any neurogenic inflammation. And then prednisone is also pretty good at reducing, uh, neurogenic inflammation is a, a decent um, uh, anti-inflammatory medication. Or would you give both the anti-inflammatory and verapamil? So what do you guys think? I don't know, ask pharmacy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You try to try to be in, independent if you can. But no, there's nothing wrong with asking pharmacy if you wanted to. <laughs> All right. So what is our option? What's the winner? Winner, winner, chicken dinner is Verapamil. All right. All right, so... All right, here's the thing. You're, you're not like kind of wrong, but in a way it's not the best option. So this is where on an exam, verapamil would probably be the choice, but in a true clinical scenario, you have to think about something. It's gonna take a little bit of time for verapamil to really kick in and have some significant kind of preventative effects. So what you would want to do is put someone on a prednisone taper 50 milligrams you can actually go up to 80 milligrams if you needed to but 50 milligrams qd over it tapered over maybe 10 to 12 days and that'll give time for the verapamil to start really kicking in so in a clinical scenario i would actually do prednisone that'll bridge the gap until the verapamil starts to kick in okay all righty so again i would go with prednisone and verapamil all righty. Yep. So yeah, you're bridging it. That's the exact point, Ramea, is that you're you're bridging the effect of the prophylactic medication with the prednisone, which is why it's kind of like the ideal option. All righty. So the other question that we should always ask is: there any risk factor? So we yeah we we aborted the headache. We are giving some prophylactic medications, some prevention medications. But one of the things that we also want to think about is what in this guy's history could we potentially do to try to reduce some of the risk factors that could be contributing or triggers, potential triggers uh, to these cluster headaches, okay? So he is a smoker, he's a COPD or and a smoker. Could we potentially tell him to say, hey, dude, you gotta, you gotta cut the smoking out. Maybe we can consider some nicotine patches. Maybe we should consider some Wellbutrin. Maybe we should consider some Chantix. You also should reduce your alcohol intake, or should we say, hey man, keep watching Ninjaner because that stuff is a natural stress reducer. <laughs> all right, so which one is it? Or would you say it's all of them? Again, think about his history. <laughs> all the above. <laughs> yeah, so he's a smoker. smoker. Smoking is a very prominent trigger. It's actually kind of the number one trigger. Uh, reduced alcohol, I mean, so alcohol intake is another trigger. Also, again, just cyclical time periods, histamine release, um, certain types of allergies, and stressors. Stressors are always going to be a potential thing as well. <laughs> Someone said C is highly potent, but D is good. I, lo I love it. Thank you, Harsh Mathal. That's awesome. So, yeah, all of the above. Any way that you can kind of reduce stress, if that is watching engineering, that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, reducing the alcohol take and then smoking sensation is going to be kind of the best decision here. So we've aborted the headache. We got the prevention prophylactic medications on board. We're going to try to 
uh, advise the patient to try to avoid these particular things that are potential triggers and then tell him to continue to follow up with his primary care physician, right? All right, engineers, you guys are smart. Some of you guys picked up the diagnosis right from the get-go, um, which is awesome. So, I, again, you guys, are, you guys are so awesome. You guys, I'm so proud of you guys. You guys are smart, smart, smart people, um, and, I, and I just love it. Um, any questions? A um, couple minutes here before we kind of um, finish this, and, again, we'll pick it back up next week where we'll do um, another uh, 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 case study. Uh, next week, just to give you a prelude, it's going to be on some visual um, dysfunction or visual abnormalities so you guys can think about that maybe start forming some differentials for visual abnormalities <laughs> um, but yeah I, I hope this helped and I hope that you guys liked it if you guys have any questions though hit me uh, with some questions while we have a couple minutes oh, thank you Dr. Kelly You need to do it more. All right, we're gonna keep doing this. All right. Awesome as always, thank you. What's your favorite food? Ooh, that's a tough one. I mean, you can't go wrong with pizza. You can't go wrong with pizza, but I, I also, I'm a, I'm a big fan of like uh, these chicken sandwiches that I get. Um, it's called Drip the Flavor Lab, it's my, it's my jam. Are you a doctor? I'm a PA. PA, baby. What do you think of giving a naloxone in an opioid overdose to rest situation? If it's necessary, yeah. I mean, prednisone action and actual headache. So again, prednisone is, it's, it's, it's again, it's a, it's a glucocorticoid. So glucocorticoids work by uh, multiple different mechanisms. And these mechanisms, uh, it's not completely known, but it may be, be involved in inhibiting like prostaglandin and Histamine release, it may be involved in, again, just reducing a lot of that neurogenic inflammation. Are you a working doctor or what? I'm not a doctor, I'm a PA, but yes, I do work in the neurocritical care um, unit. Alrighty. Hi, Nish News. Well, I appreciate all of this. I thank you guys for being so awesome.